So if there's no objections, why don't we get started uh, pretty much right on time. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight and the bad weather. And, uh, and it's around the holiday season and all. We appreciate uh, you giving up your time to come and talk about uh, this important issue with the town. Uh, this is a follow-on from the last month's tri-board meeting. Uh, if you recall, uh, the last month, uh, the ad hoc committee presented their proposal, their developed material based upon the uh, objectives and the criteria that the tri-boards gave them. And we've had a month now for the boards to digest that, uh, consider what the implications are, uh, different aspects of the projects. And we had asked the boards to um, deliberate on that and bring back feedback for this meeting, uh, which we'll have uh, later this uh, later uh, in the meeting. Um, so for tonight, we're going to have uh, opening comments from the uh, ad hoc committee. Um, we're going to have uh, an overview of the hazmat test results that were conducted on the schools. Um, discussion about frequently asked questions that uh, the committee has compiled and uh, a discussion about how ad hoc proceeded through their process. Um, there's also going to be an update from the finance subcommittee of the ad hoc committee talking about uh, the financial ramifications of the project. Uh, also some feedback on the planning subcommittee uh, specifically with regard to what we could do with the building should this proposal go forward in, in the way it was proposed. And also some more discussion about uh, communications and uh, and uh, public relations with the community and other stakeholders. Then uh, we're going to suggest that we spend time in a general discussion, uh, solicit feedback from the boards to the ad hoc committee, and let's just open it up for uh, a good discussion about uh, what the nature of the project is, what are we trying to accomplish, and where do we go from here. Uh, Mike, if you would, please. I'll try to project my voice a little better. There is a microphone, but it's the best I could do here. Um, Thank you, everybody, for coming. My name is Mike Ergo. I'm the chairman of the Ad Hoc School Building Committee. I know uh, Star Wars opened tonight, if anybody didn't know, so I'm, I'm appreciative of who came out tonight. Um, so what we wanted to do quickly is um, I just want to run through a, a brief summary of what we touched on last meeting um, and not take too much time to go over that, but I know there's some newer people in the audience who weren't here last time, so I wanted to run through that, and then obviously all the things Mark just mentioned. Um, so uh, he kind of outlined what we're going to go over today. Um, last time we kind of hit on the fact that these were the areas that were of focus for our committee. Um, we are really looking into the safety, the maintenance and energy concerns, and the educational upgrades. Um, I'm going to provide this handout to everybody before the end of the evening, so I won't go through it. You can definitely read through it. We did go over it last time. Um, but there are obviously a lot of needs for our school, so it's a challenge um, for the committee to try to tackle all these uh, as well as consider the um, financial implications, educational implications, and all the things that go with it. But we're proud of what we've been able to put together, and we'll kind of go over that a little bit right now. Um, these are some steps we've taken to date, and um, we've been meeting every Monday night. Um, we've tried to come up with a, an approach that minimizes construction costs, minimizes costs as, as well as we can, while also meeting the educational needs of the community and putting a state-of-the-art uh, facility forward here. Um, we've basically decided on renovate as new. Um, that's how we kind of started. We're going to talk about another approach that we're looking at that we think will save us actually a little bit more money on one of the buildings tonight. But that's where we had started. Um, renovate as new maximizes our state reimbursement. So basically, um, when you do a renovate as new project or, or um, an alterations project, as we're going to discuss a little bit tonight, you are able to get 46.07% uh, of that project's uh, funds from the state. So nearly half of the money will be paid for by the state. We all pay our state taxes, so it's nice to get some of that back to the community. It's a, it's a great way to look at the project and help offset the costs that are going to be great for a project such as this. Um, we've, uh, we've talked with Cuisinberry Architects. Rusty's here. He'll talk a little bit tonight. They've been uh, working with us for many years on trying to get a great project done here in town. They have a, a, a very strong familiarity with this project, and um, they've been helping to guide us, although I will say the committee is guiding the progress of this project. The architectural firm is not. We've uh, worked very hard as a committee to kind of give direction to the architectural firm. And you know, Rusty's been very accommodating. We've talked quite a bit. Um, and I can't say enough about him, so I'm happy he's helping us out with this. 
Um, one of the things you'll hear us, uh, we talked about last time, is bringing the sixth grade back over to the elementary school. It's currently at the middle high school, and there were reasons for that. Um, we started out thinking we wouldn't do that. Um, we were trying to cut costs. That's where we kind of started. However, as we looked more at it, we know it makes educational sense. There's plenty of studies that show that. It's better to have the kids over there but it even made fiscal sense. So this was another reason that we really looked at that as the way we wanted to go. Um, you know, it's basically, if we didn't bring them back over, it cuts our reimbursement from the state by about 10%. And the reason for that is we aren't fully utilizing the space in the elementary school right now. So we, so this helps us to fully utilize that space, thus realize full reimbursement from the state, the 46.07%. Um, we decided as a committee to perform hazmat testing, which is um, environmental testing on the elementary school and strategically. Um, not every single place has been tested, but we wanted to do some testing to have an idea of what we were looking at over there, what the problems were. <laughs> the last time that wasn't done, um, and there were different reasons for that. The committee, of course, did a really great job last time, and it wasn't something they didn't do on purpose. They just um, they, they wanted to... Uh, they put money in reserves, what they felt would be appropriate. But we wanted to really hone in on a correct number this time. So we did the testing. We're going to go over those results tonight. Um, we're going to present to you the options that we uh, feel are the most appropriate and the best options. We are proud of these options. We have done a lot of homework. These are the options we feel are the best ones for the town. We'll go over that tonight. And we're going to um, provide some updates from a couple of our subcommittee work groups, our communications group, and our, um, uh, we have some other, uh, another group that's going to talk to you as well. Pam's going to talk to you. So here's an overlay of what we talked about last time. Again, you'll have this handout to bring with you. It'll be available on the website and everywhere, but it's an aerial view that kind of goes over. You can see, um, you know, you have the elementary school right here. Um, we're going to talk about the fact that there's a central kitchen addition we're going to put here. It's really the only additional space we're adding onto the school. And the central kitchen will serve both schools. It's a way for us being fiscally responsible. We're trying to be as smart as we can with funds here. So that, that kitchen will cook all the food, and it'll bring it over to what we are going to propose as the new middle high school over on, this, um, on the same side of the street as the elementary school. As you can see here on the overview, we have the uh, middle high school, which is the addition to what's now the gymatorium. So, and then over here we have uh, what we we're proposing will be demolish the, um, the middle school as it sits right now. We'll get into our reasoning for this as we continue with the presentation. So this is a more detailed look at both levels of the elementary school. Um, Again, as I said already, we are proposing to take down less walls. You know, if you do a home renovation, you know, the less you take down, the less it costs. The more you, you, you put bathrooms where there's already plumbing, the less it costs. We're trying to do those kind of things. So you'll see here, um, the walls are kind of where they are. We are, one of the things, as I said uh, last time, and it shows in the beginning slide, we were, uh, one of the things that came up is our, our computer labs really should be on the first floor. Little ones shouldn't be going upstairs for classes. It's kind of a fire concern. It's something that's been pointed out to us. So we do have a media center, computer lab combo down here. Um, you can see the first pre-K and um, kindergarten classes are on this floor. You can see where we've moved the main office right to the front of the building. It's, it's, it's currently right over here. We've moved it over here. It's security. Um, we definitely need to do a better job with securing our facilities. They're not properly secured. We do have cameras. We do have locked front doors, but we don't have somebody right there when you walk in. And that is a, that is a concern for us. We're going to talk more about that. Um, we, with this plan, we are looking to add um, a multi-purpose room and we will use the current gymnasium. But the way the gym is now, we're just moving it over. So the stage is over here right now. We're moving the stage over here. It's going to be a removable stage. So that way we can, um, again, fully utilize our space. We want flexible space. You're going to notice with this presentation, a lot of flexible space, multi-uses. It's going to give us a rubberized gym floor that's safe for the kids. Right now we have a floor that's not safe for the kids. We have, we have had issues with kids breaking bones and things like this on this floor. So we need to fix that. Um, music and art. And then we have the uh, older grades up top here. 
Again, we'll talk more about this. Um, this is this is an overview of the proposed new middle high school. The middle school will mo main, mainly be on the first level, which is what you're looking at here. We have um, the gymatorium over here. We have the media center, new media center we put here, and then all the uh, labs and art rooms, a cafeteria with a separate music area that we can use for chorus. And we do still have the band room, which um, is over on this side, which we would improve the acoustics. That's another issue we have with the band room right now. The acoustics are not proper, which is the case in a lot of the school as it is. And then we have the second floor. The second floor, And again, you notice on here, I went over this last time, but a lot of flexible space. We're, not, we're purposely not identifying space for a particular teacher. We know that we have a small population in this town. So in order to be very fiscally responsible, we want to have flexible space so that when we know what one year we have more kids in an English than we do the year before, we can move them into a larger classroom. And you'll see here, 650 square feet language, 500 square feet language. So we have different size language classrooms. And that's the way for the math and the other classes as well. Um, I didn't preface my comments by saying um, it, we, we're going to give an opportunity for questions at, at the end here. So we want to just kind of go through everything. We have try to kind of move things along as quickly as we can. We have a lot of material, but we want to just get through it. So questions will definitely be answered, but at the end of when we're done presenting. So, um, so that kind of brings us to this, a very small summary of what we went over last meeting. We were here for a couple of hours. So um, I will hand this stuff out afterwards. Um, but what I wanted to do is turn it over to Rusty to go over the next couple of slides. He'll update you on some things that have gone on over the last month since we last met. Um, and just before I do turn it over, I do realize the most important thing tonight is to hear all of your feedback. And we definitely will give plenty of time for that. So thank you for hearing us first. Rusty. Good evening. Uh, a couple of things, or quite a few things have happened, but one major uh, piece uh, of, uh, uh, of new information is we, we did schedule a meeting at the State Department of Education with the Office, uh, the Office of School Construction Grants uh, because there were several questions that have been raised about the type of projects that we're doing. One thing I'll say is when they looked at the plan that we, that's being proposed, they naturally gravitated towards what we call option C, which is everything on the west side of the, uh, of the, of the, of route two. In fact, many of them were quite amazed that the, the, the school buildings were split up and they were very, very concerned about the security. Um, so that was, that was interesting to, to hear from them just in looking as they looked at the, at the plans. Uh, when we discussed the elementary school, there were, everybody was on board that made a, a good sense for uh, a renovator's new project. On the, on the high school, middle school project, when, what they came back with the suggestion was, you know, if we were to do the project on, on the west side of Route 2, they said you might want to look at alterations and additions as an option. Now, we looked at it preliminarily on, in, in uh, prior reviews. Uh, but as we went back and we looked at it, we saw, thought that there were maybe some advantages here. They, they assured us that uh, if there's a space standard issue, and I think in the past I've said if you're a renovator is new, you have a better shot of getting a Spain space standard waiver. But they assured us based on the conditions that we're dealing with and the fact that the school split up, that that would not be an, uh, an issue as we, if we were to seek a space standard waiver on what we call option C. Uh, but as we move forward, we, we really discovered that by going to an alterations and extension project, the alteration portion would be the, the gymatorium building. There are components of that building that don't have to be replaced. There, some of them are in good shape. Some of them uh, we will replace, and everything will be brought up to code. But what that does for us is it allows us to keep uh, certain parts of that building, certain finishes in that building, and thereby reduce cost and not impact reimbursement at all. So it was, it was interesting that they suggested it. We looked at it. In fact, some of the updated budgets are now reflecting that because the savings is, is fairly substantial. I think it was somewhere in the a range of close to a million dollars that we saved by going that route. Uh, so that was one thing that came about from our meeting with the state. The other... Uh, uh, 
piece of information that we received was the hazmat testing. And as we had mentioned last time, there were tests that were being done. In 2010, I believe it was, there was hazmat PCB testing uh, that, was, that had occurred at the, at the 1960s, 60s, 50s building here in, the, in this particular part of the school. And that had come back positive. The exterior clock had been tested. So we reviewed with the hazmat consultant what other areas of the building we should test, and we went through and we identified that we really should test the clock at the elementary school. Uh, we should test floor mastic, the, the, the glue under the floor tiles, uh, should test the wall paints. We made, we made certain assumptions that if the windows clock are positive, then the door clock on the exterior would also be positive. It's a fairly safe assumption to make. So we made some basic assumptions that don't have uh, significant financial consequences, but we wanted to focus on areas that if they are positive, that we are aware of them and that, that the financial aspect uh, of it could be reflected in, in, in the budget. When we went through this process, what we did find, and it was a mixed bag, but on the elementary school, the exterior window clock was positive. So even though the windows had been replaced, if all the clock, the prior clock, had not been cleaned off, uh, the, the, the clock came back positive, and that's what they're finding. So that's something that we have to contend with. And that clock is over a 50 part per million. In fact, it's, it's fairly significant. It's, it's fairly high. Um, but the, the, the 50 part per million is a threshold that, that requires that some action be taken on it. And just for your information, when we tested the clock uh, at the middle high school in the 50s and 60s area, uh, we had discovered that, okay, that clock has a PCBs and it was a, an elevated level as well. When we tested the floor mastic and also the paint, those results came back positive, but it was mixed. Uh, what you'll notice uh, that for the floor mastic uh, at the elementary school, that came back positive, but you can see it's 2.5 to 3.9 parts per million. It's a very low number, but it's, there's a presence there. Uh, also, in, in the wall paint, it's about 3.9 to 440. Uh, it's below 50, which is a, a major threshold, but it's above 1, so we have to do something about it. Um, and then the, the windows had come back positive. At the high school, middle school, at the 1950s building, um, the floor mastic, again, uh, is below 1 part per million or none detected. This was, this was kind of surprising. It was interesting that 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 did not have any uh, PCBs. Anything that's below one, uh, you don't have to do anything about. It's either ND, which is non-detected, or uh, less than one. Um, the, the wall paint came back at 2.8 to 11, so that's above one, and then, therefore we have to contend with that. Um, and then what we found, that there was no PC, this, uh, PCBs uh, uh, detected in the exterior window column. So that's interesting because Prior assumptions had been, oh, the clock in, in the 60s section has come back positive, so the 50s probably is positive. That's not the case. Uh, in the 60s, uh, we found that the, that the floor mastic ranges from 6.4, uh, uh, from none detected to 6.4, uh, and then the wall paint was positive as well. So what it comes down to is we have PCBs in the paint, we have PCBs in the floor mastic, and we have PCBs in the windows. Now, these are some of the major ticket items, and the reason to know this was that as we budget for the future, as we budget a project, we need to understand what's positive so we can appropriately budget uh, how we would remediate in these areas. Uh, and that's now being reflected in our new budgets. Uh, in, in, in many ways, what you'll see is even though in some areas we saved money, th this did end up driving the, the hazmat uh, estimate up from what we were previously carrying. So based on that, uh, again, the same project scope as we've had before, uh, what you see is we updated the, the numbers and, and we're, we, we were able to uh, look at different ways of saving money and as I've mentioned by additions and alterations uh, a project, Looking at that cost, looking at the additional hazmat cost, we have some, some updated numbers. Scope uh, did not change in, in terms of how, how we're renovating the space or the, um, or the, uh, the extent of renovation. 
One other thing that we did look at uh, is by looking at potentially a single contractor a com combined bid, uh, uh, take advantage of the, uh, the, uh, the fact that you have a, a larger scale project so you will have some savings there. And also we looked at what the escalation has been uh, over, the, over the last two years, we went through a lot of different uh, companies that predict escalation projects. And it's been in the two and a half, three, three and a half percent range. So we, we were carrying 4% per year. We, we reduced that to 3%. So that's all reflected in, in these updated numbers. We also started looking at what would happen is if we did separate projects. Um, and separate projects have, uh, you know, there's a different, uh, a number of concerns, but what we wanted to do is um, try to address how one would approach two separate projects. One of the things that right away, and we discussed this actually much earlier too, uh, is that you start to uh, have an escalation because if you do one project and then you wait and then you do the second project after the first one's done, a lot of time has gone by and then that, that requires us to carry escalation costs for the new project. Uh, that's under the assumption that, that you go for both projects and get them both approved at the same time. You just wait for one project to be done after, after the second one. Um, Another challenge would be that you wouldn't be addressing hazmat in, in one of the projects, whichever one is the, the second project to be done. Then there comes the question of which project would it be? Would it be the high school or the elementary school? If it's, if it's the elementary school, uh, you have accreditation concerns from NEASC. Um, if, you did, didn't do the, if you did the elementary school, you would build a new kitchen. If you did the high school second, uh, that kitchen project would have to be considered. Uh, security at one of the projects would not be addressed. And this is purely saying, hypothetical, saying if you simply say we'll do one building, uh, what, what some of the implications are. Um, you know, I won't go through all of them, but we'd have to look at, uh, reevaluate the building systems after three years to what the conditions are. Because building systems, as they get older, you have to consider what, what something we maybe have been considering saving <coughs> may not be uh, at that point anymore. Um, and the question that would come up is uh, every year, and this happens only if you're not uh, applying for both projects at the same time. If you apply for one project uh, and then three or four years later apply for the, a grant for the second project, historically the data has been that your reimbursement rate goes down um, every year. Uh, yeah, so that, that's a potential. Um, and one of the things that would happen is, is, let's say you're working on the elementary school, that the science program at, at Wheeler uh, would be a, uh, another issue. So programmatically, educationally, there would be some implications there as well. But we did look at this, and we tried to put scenarios together that we could then establish what the budget impacts would be, and, and you'll see that in a later slide. Um, a request was made to, to look at, uh, does it make sense to use the elementary school as the high school and vice versa, you put the, and bring the elementary school over here. Um, just a couple of major things here. Uh, number one, uh, you wouldn't be utilizing your spaces to the, the, the advantage in terms of space standards, so you, you would reduce your uh, reimbursement standards at, at both buildings. Uh, phasing would be very difficult uh, in, in that scenario. Uh, and, and this scenario is basically saying just Keep these two buildings, uh, don't put the addition on the gymatorium, uh, and, and try to renovate it. So that, that'll cause uh, some extreme difficulty when it comes to phasing. Uh, but one of the interesting uh, issues that came out of this was the right sizing of the rooms. If you're trying to use the high school, the elementary school for high school, those classrooms are developed for 24, 22 to 24 kids. Our issue at the high school is that we, we've got as classes that range from 10 to 19 or 20. Now, they'll be in a, in a room that's oversized for them. And the opposite happens when you bring the elementary students over here. That's a pretty standard class of about 22, 20, you know, 22 students or so. And these rooms, many rooms here, are much smaller. So you have the opposite effect in terms of the adequacy of the space when you look at this space, uh, at putting the elementary school students in this space. So many reasons. Uh, also, this would require more hazmat work to be done. Um, and ultimately, what, what we found is that the cost uh, went up quite significantly under the scenario. 
going in, I thought, well, maybe that's something we hadn't explored. Maybe it, it, there'll, there'll be some savings. It, it didn't turn out to be that way. The other approach that we looked at uh, is what if we did multiple smaller projects? Um, and we try to, to look at these and say, there's got to be a, an organization to how we would approach these projects. Uh, hazmat remediation would be the first, first project. Now, that has many aspects to it. For instance, when you take the tile out, the, the mastic out from the floor, now you've got to put new flooring back. Uh, if you take the windows out and the caulk out, you've got to put new windows in. When you take out the, the paint on the walls, you've got to address those. And so there's many layers of new work that has to happen. So what you find is it's a fairly significant project if it's done by itself. Now, the challenge with doing work this way is you tend to reduce your reimbursement because of the way the state is set up in terms of how, how funding is provided uh, because now you're falling into the renovation categories where it's renovation and replacement, and those items are not uh, eligible for, for reimbursement because we're not falling into the renovators new category, we're not falling into the additions and alterations category, so we're purely falling into a category that says, we're going to renovate the building and replace things. Well, the R's are a bad thing when you start looking at the state, the way they see if you renovate or replace um, and refurbish, all those things are ineligible. So that's why what you see, um, it, when these numbers are developed, these numbers are a lot lower than if the same work was done under one larger project that was a renovated new project. Uh, you, you'll notice that these numbers are fairly, fairly low. There are some projects that you can do that won't, it won't affect your reimbursement rate. But for the most part, under this scenario, you would have uh, some significant uh, reduction in, in your reimbursement. Not to say that, you know, I'm assuming that these projects are, I have to make certain assumptions in budgeting, uh, that these are gonna happen over multiple years and therefore, escalation comes into play. Therefore, um, you know you have to look at you know what what project happens when, and that's reflected in some of these costs. Now we didn't even go; we stopped at this point. We said, okay, there'd be no site work. There's no building additions and demolition, uh, but but you can see that at this point we're at 38 million dollars on the project costs over the years, uh, and a 27.9 million dollar net cost to the town. So that, that, uh, that's a fairly significant change in terms of the amount of work that's being done and the, and the state reimbursement uh, on it as well. Um, so a lot of the things we've looked at here, and I really need to make this clear that we are a committee that was formed about three, four months ago, but there was a committee that was formed before us, and they did a lot of work. And they did a great job, and they made our job a lot easier as it is now. And I, I mention that because a lot of the things that we're presenting today are things that they had looked at already, but they came up over the last month that we want to really make sure that everybody knows that we've, we're crossing our T's and dotting our I's here. I mean, we're looking at everything. We're looking at every option. We're looking at how can this be affordable. I'm, I'm a taxpayer here, too. I want this to be affordable and make sense for our town. So, But you can see here... Um, the options which Rusty just described. Um, so, you know, if we were to go and try to do one school, you know, we're netting eight and a half million. Two, you know, the other school, 14, almost 15 million. So the total there is more than option three, which is our preferred option as a committee. Option three is the option that I described earlier. That's where we get the full reimbursement. That's we, what we as a committee have come to the conclusion is the best option for the town. Um, and then with the multiple smaller projects, again, we're only addressing major issues and it costs us more. So I, 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 want, you, I want everybody to understand, you know, I, I'm, I'm just a citizen like all of you here, just a volunteer, and we as a committee really looked at all this stuff and we've, we've decided this is the direction that we need to go in as a town. Um, there's too many unknowns with the other scenarios putting things off, escalation costs. I mean, there's so many unknown things that these are just preliminary numbers on these option one, two, and four that could blow, could blow up. We, we have a really good idea on option three of how much this is going to cost. We've done a lot of work. 
We know what our reimbursement's going to be. We know what the issues are for the most part on the PCV hazmat remediation. Uh, we know that what we're dealing with. So that's why we have a really strong comfort level with this project. And besides the fact that there are serious educational benefits to what we're doing, and we think there's some really great things that can be done on this side of the road as well. Um, we're going to get into that in just a minute. Pam's going to give a little presentation on those two things as we try to move things along. But just to kind of bring you back, where's the cost on this? Option three, again, that we think is the best option. Um, we did some, some more number crunching based on the new number, which is lower than last time we came here. And what we hope is every time we come here, it's lower because we're continually working to get the number down. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But right now, the 21.47... We made a phone call this week, and for those who pay attention, interest rates, short-term interest rates did go up. However, long-term interest rates not projected to really be a problem right now. So we made a phone call, just one, poten one potential lender, and this is where we would be if we borrowed the money today, is at 20 years, if we borrowed 20 years, three, three and a quarter percent, and um, that goes over our payments and our cumulative interest, it's about 11% tax increase. So that's a little bit less than what we talked about last time. I want to emphasize, we're not done, okay? What we're hoping tonight is to kind of be able to really move things forward, but we are continually looking at options, continually looking at how we can make this better, more affordable. Um, but it's more than just money. This, this is more than just money. This, this, this is a big deal, what we're talking about here. So I want to bring up Pam Patemri, who's on our committee, and she's going to go over just a couple of slides here. And we'll keep going. Um, I was asked to be on the committee um, because of my experience and my background. And I didn't necessarily feel that that was as important, but the committee did ask me to share this. Um, so I came to the committee as a central office administrator. So my background is as an educator, but also as an administrator. So what I'm going to speak to you about is um, I feel very passionate about, and I know at our last meeting it came across um, very strongly because I know how hard this committee's worked. I believe in this plan. I came in with a completely open mind, not knowing what had happened in the past, but knowing what our cause or our charge was going forward. And I needed to feel that this was absolutely the best plan that we were putting forward to, um, to the voters. And we do have students in the system, children in the system. We are taxpayers. And my position in um, the school system is pupil personnel. So if you know anything about pup pupil personnel, it's special education, 504, and the most costly program in the district. So I'm very cognizant of what things cost. Um, additionally, I've lived through a $30 million building renovation, so I know what the impact is to staff and to students. And my goal was to really keep an open mind, make sure that we were looking at mitigating costs at all, at all, at all costs, um, looking at different creative options on how we could bring the costs down to taxpayers, and also to focus on what the most important thing is, and that is the educational benefit of what we're presenting to the voters. So the first thing I want to present to you is, did I, do I know how to use this? Probably not. Okay, wait. That one goes forward. Okay is um, the question was raised, well, what were we going to do with the old building? And I don't look at it as a liability to the town. I look at it as an opportunity to the town because I think there are a lot of creative things that we could do um, with regard to bringing revenue into the district. Um, you know, that's certainly up to the town and the finance board and the school department with how they do that. But my job is to research what's been done with old buildings and what would make sense to North Stonington. So there were a lot of different options that I looked at. Um, the first is to just simply repurpose the space. So looking at um, the need for the youth gym recreation program, so there were districts that had done that. Um, there were districts that looked at special education transition programs. That's one of the more costlier items for school districts to mitigate. Um, so looking at how can we keep kids in district and also generate other kids, other districts bringing kids into districts so that we can have a reduced tuition rate. Alternative education programs, what options can we bring um, to our students that are, are in our traditional program? Um, we talk often about college and career readiness, but I think we don't talk enough about career readiness, so those would give those options. We could rethink about that space. So we could look at private school partnerships. There are a lot of private schools right now who are looking to relocate their programs and would maybe lease the space. 
the university classroom is a great opportunity for our students doing dual enrollment, um, gaining college credit while they're going through high school. Partnership classrooms, again, looking at special education programs that we could do in partnerships so our students weren't traveling so far. We could offer those placements to out of districts, other <coughs> districts like Stonington, Groton, surrounding areas. <coughs> or we could completely reimagine the space. So we could say, what does our community need? And if you look at Westerly, they, they created from one of their closed elementary schools, the Tower Street Community Center, and they're all community service type agencies that they brought in that lease space from the district. So do we need something like an employment training center for people who need to be re-educated or re-employed? A hub for technology is really big right now where we're looking at partnerships with um, businesses like a Pfizer or um, an electric boat where we're actually really building on um, enhancement programs, technology programs for students, or adult learning and doing a more comprehensive approach to our adult learning, not only for our students, but for lifelong learners. So we look at renovating old versus building new. And I think the thing that struck me is how old our buildings really look. And um, I am in a different part of the state, so in Avon particularly, so I see a lot of the the new buildings that are being built and what they're doing. Um, so it really stands out to me what we could do and I find it exciting what we could do. So thinking in terms of what was 21st or 20th century classrooms were reading, writing, and arithmetic. And I think to sum it up, I wanted to put that quote in there because I think it's important. Reading and writing, arithmetic and grammar do not constitute education any more than knife, fork, and spoon constitute a dinner. So when you think about that, and you think about what we're asking our students and our educators to do today, it looks very different. So we're talking about collaboration, communication, creativity, critical thinking, and do our facilities really support that? The bottom line is, if we want to talk about economic growth to the town, we have to think about what opportunities we're offering to students that when they grow and go, they're going to want to come back and reinvest in our town. So from an instructional opportunity standpoint, why do this? First of all, I think the obvious is just you decrease the passing time from having to go from one building to another. So you automatically increase instructional time, which is very important for what we're asking our educators to get through in the curriculum today. The one thing that was so important, we have the question of changing enrollment. Is enrollment going to change in our district? It could. We could go more to a technology base where we have virtual learning, we may not have the enrollment numbers that we do now, or they may expand. So are we going to be able to use space flexibly to be able to meet all of those needs? Currently, the things that we would benefit from are expanding and enhancing the program of study alone, so things we can do right now. We can address the early childhood requirements for space and developmentally appropriate instruction because our early childhood classrooms, our preschool classrooms, kindergarten classrooms, the space requirements are different, and those are mandates. Um, the National Science Teachers Association, this to me was really striking. One of the things that the last committee looked at and was really important to um, the community as a whole was how we're using our science labs and how we needed to update our science labs. So if you think about, I looked at what were the recommendations, and really the recommendations are flexible space to be able to do experimentation, do lab works, um, you know, go out into the environment. So to have that flexibility of space to, if we need a chemistry or a biology, are you be able to recreate that space and offer more opportunities for kids? Um, providing an environment basically that supports those 21st century skills. And I think that picture really showed it looked very different what classrooms look like today. And it's all about collaboration, critical thinking, and research. The one thing that stands out to me, though, and maybe I know too much as an administrator, is the safety issue. Um, it does very much concern me. Um, I've been through a lot of school training and school safety training, and the tunnel stands out. And there was one thing on our committee that we weren't talking about. And I thought, gosh, do I want to be, you know, the the person who puts this, you know, elephant in the room on the table? But I think it's important that we remember that. And the the roadway and the gating system that we have between the tunnel is very concerning. And I put this quote in there so that we're reminded, and this isn't my quote, but rampage shootings happen in two kinds of places, in a small town in the middle of nowhere, or in an excerpt. 
the one institution that's really visible, and it's so true being on Route 2, to the entire community is the school. So I don't say that to scare, I say that to be mindful of why we're doing this. There are a lot of good reasons. Proximity control in the elementary school, relocating the front office so that the, you can vet who's coming in and out of the building is critical, it's a, it's, it's a must have. And the opportunity to assess and align current technology infrastructures with recommended safety and security needs. And those change on an ongoing basis. So does our infrastructure support the changes that might be necessary? Um, and are we doing it in a cost-effective way? So building new is much less expensive, believe it or not, than retrofitting technology infrastructure. Mitigation and elimination of toxic materials. I put this last because, again, this is kind of a no-brainer. Um, it's a reasonable expectation of parents that our buildings are safe for our students, for our children. The key to this, though, is not should we do it, it's how do we do it. So the challenge, really, our next steps are looking at balancing fiscal responsibility with educational improvements, and that's what this is all about. So you have to look at what is the overall savings to the town. So when you are looking at managing, maintaining old buildings, it's expensive. And it's obviously more cost effective to maintain new buildings. So what does that equate to? Where could we use that money? Well, there's an automatic amount of money, dollar amount, that goes right back into per pupil spending and programming, professional development. Makes sense. Um, it allows for the, the repurposing of space and a reallocation of funds to address budget impact items. And again, I say this as a special ed director, that I know what the budget impact items are. So you cannot control things like the rising utility costs state mandates, contra contractual obligations, special education tuition costs, they're all fluctuating and it's a moving target. So you have to be able to have a way to mitigate those expenses and this would allow us to do that. Um, simply stated, I just think it's obvious that bringing educational opportunities to our children that are afforded in other communities is our collective responsibility and I don't think we should forget that. And ensuring that the environment is safe and conducive to learning it's fundamental, and it's the foundation of the plan that we're presenting. Hi, everybody. My name is Mike Osborne, and we're going to talk about communication. We're going to look at it as effective transparency, the flow of communication going out, and the ability to receive communication coming back in. So we can really move this project along uh, with everybody's feedback and intent. Uh, overall, the objective of this committee is to provide excellent communication to the entire residents of North Stonington on this project that represents the true intent of the selectmen. Now, in order to do this, we want to define a very simple process to follow so it's easy, it's effective. Second, we want to go ahead and identify all the available methods of communication to the folks of North Stonington. And finally, how do we develop materials and what materials do we have to get out to the residents? Now first let's talk about the process. Keep it simple. We have the communication group that's going to have subgroups that are going to develop the information and also identify the methods to get that information out. Now those are going to be presented to the ad hoc committee. The ad hoc committee will review it to make sure it's in line with the project. And finally, Mike Ergo, our chairman, will take it to a specified selectman. And we'll need to identify who that is. So it can go to the selectman, they can see the information, easily give a quick turnaround of, okay, it's ready to go. Or, no, we have a few questions on this, let's make sure it's actually in line with our intent and what the residents need to hear. All right, after it's approved, then the selectmen will go ahead and give it back and we'll go ahead and disseminate the information and try to make that as quick as possible so people are getting updated and accurate information. Now, what methods of distribution can we use? Wow, as I start talking to different people in this town and just in this room, there are a lot of tools available to us. And so we're just going to read down those. First, town gatherings. Simple, 
We try to get everybody together, but we know not everyone can make those town gatherings, but they're effective for being able to do information out and get Q&A. Town websites and also the North Stonington Bulletin, two websites that we can have a designated space on a page where people can have links to updated documents as well as videos. Printed news, um, we we're going to do news releases that can go out to the New London Day, Mystic River Press, North Stonington Quarterly, and also the Westerly Sun. SECTV, there's an opportunity where we can get free broadcasting, specifically made for this intent. So that's great. We'll have some TV coverage. Postage, of course, we'll be planning to mail out some uh, uh, pamphlets. Those are good because some people don't watch TV. Some people don't have the internet. We got to get it into their mailbox. So everybody has the opportunity to be aware of what's going on and what information is out there and how they can get more information. Of course, the Board of Education has a, a nice distribution of emails. So we'll ask them to go ahead and distribute information for us. Um, the PTA is another location. Teacher union leadership, social media. You know, having a, a social media and then somebody designated that is familiar with giving response on social media and posting. And then last but not least, radio. Um, we'll be able to get on radio and to have actual conversations on talk shows. <coughs> oh, did I go? There we go. Now, currently, this is the information that we have available and also plan to develop. Uh, first, we want to get out an article in the North Stonington Quarterly. Um, I believe today's the deadline to <laughs> have an article ready um, and, and have that going out, but that needs to be vetted by our, our selectmen and make sure it's a nice overview of the project as well as some simple, you know, uh, big picture question and answers that have already been developed that can be sent out in this article. If you get the ball rolling to get everybody's, we can get that light going. We have a question and answer that's already been initiated, but more questions are going to arise. As new information comes up on the project or changes in the project that are going to be better, there's going to be questions about that. We want to make sure we continue to develop this question and answer that's going to be available on the town website and make sure we keep that available to everyone. Also an ad hoc briefing report. It's just a summary of the history that brought us to where we are today, the needs to do this project, and some of the other things. So it's just a simple historical value and also bringing people up to speed. Uh, also three minute videos. We wanna develop a couple of three minute videos that can be utilized in various aspects. Um, they might be on YouTube links through the, the media or they can be sent to the press or, or other ways. And then presentations. We'd like to develop a few simple presentations that there might be venues out there that different people can say, hey, I would like to advocate for this project or at least make people aware of this project to get information to them that they can bring those out uh, to different venues. And then what's really important, a feedback link for our residents. Once they do get the information, Many times they might be sitting there going, what do I do with this? I've got a question. I've got to do something. We want to give them a single point to be able to get information to. If we can provide an email that can come in, provide the comments and questions coming in that we can effectively communicate to the selectmen in the town and in this project. And then as I look around the room and we get to know each other and we get to know and, and think of ideas, any other ideas that you may have or anyone may have, to help us get this information out so there's no one being left out of important information. Thank you. Thank you, Mike and Pam. Um, appreciate all your hard work and everybody on the committee has just done a great job. Um, one other thing I wanna mention, you know, we, we already heard some feedback and we're looking forward to hearing more tonight, but as you can see, some of the feedback that we heard, we, we're, we've tried to address even tonight. So I know that, Sean, you had some questions about the possibility of maybe switching schools. So we looked into that. We feel that it's not cost effective and it doesn't make sense for a lot of ways, but we want to look into it. You know, we, we've done a lot of work and we're very comfortable with the footprint that we've put forth. And I also want to mention one of the other things that came out over the last month was the deed restrictions on this side of the road as it relates to the Wheeler Library. 
And we have reached out to the Wheel Library, and they are very willing to work with us on a project that makes sense for the town. So that is not a hindrance to us going forward with this project. Um, I want to also just kind of let you know that, you know, we've come back here um, a couple of years later since the last project. And one of the things I'm probably most proud of is when I, I was very involved just as a citizen with the last project. And I was told over and over that, listen, if this doesn't pass, costs are going to escalate and it's going to be more next time. And you know what? It probably should have been more next time, but due to the work of the committee and a lot of the banging heads together and coming up with things, we've come up with a project that's less than last time, two years later. It should have been 10% more, but it's less. And we're proud of that. And it meets the needs. And the thing is, as you look at the slide that I went over of the other options that were available, they cost us more and they don't meet the needs of the community. So we come here as one committee devoted to this project that we feel is the best option for our town and we're not done. As I said earlier, we are looking at different things to bring the cost down further. We're looking at things like alternative construction methods. We think we can bring the cost down more. We don't know yet. We haven't had people in yet. Again, we've only been meeting for, I think, maybe three months. But we know we can maybe bring this cost down more with some alternative construction methods. There's things called, I'm just learning about it today, reverse auctioning for building supplies. Some people might be familiar with this. It's something new to me. I just heard about it, and there's people on our committee looking into this. This is a way we can bring the cost down. So what I'm hoping for tonight from everybody here is, and this is a proposed, this is something that I just put up here. This hasn't been vetted by anybody. It's just an idea of a proposed schedule to move things forward. One of the asks I have tonight is for the tri board to say, let's move this project that we, we feel as a committee who's worked very hard to move forward. We want to move this project forward. We think it's the right project. That's what we're asking for. Here's a proposed timeline. We want to get more input from the people. We feel like we have the right footprint, but we're not done. We want to get more input from the people. But this is the footprint we feel is the right one. So this is a proposed schedule timeline that we think could work for the town. And uh, of course, I have the slides here. Tyler's going to pass them out to everybody so everybody can go home with these. Um, so we can think about that as a, as a possibility. Again, the overview that shows some of the things, again, the basics that we're doing here. So tonight, I look forward to your feedback. And, and we took a little longer than I wanted to. I think it was important information. So tonight, I hope that we could possibly get to the point where we can move the project we're presenting forward. We've addressed, I think, a lot of the questions that had come up that I'd heard in a, in, 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 um, a, in before this meeting, rather. Um, so some of the questions that I'd heard, I know the Board of Finance had questions about pro proposing separately. I think we, we tried to address that. Again, we don't think it makes fiscal sense with all the work we've done. We feel very strongly about this project. So with that, I'd love to open up the floor to questions and comments from our board. And I will uh, repeat the questions so that the uh, microphone can pick them up as well. <clears throat> 